Welcome guys. In this session we're going to cover handling objections. I call it handling objections because I like that better than overcoming objections. To me overcoming objections kind of has a feeling of a power struggle, kind of like you're trying to overcome them. And I think what we want to do is align ourselves with the prospects so that they see us as advocating for their benefit. So that's why we call this handling objections. Sometimes people have case-specific questions they want to talk to me about or they want to schedule me to come out and do a workshop or seminar for their company. So you can go to my website, LloydLofton.com. You can go to uh, my, email me at, Lloyd, at LloydLofton.com or you can call me on my cell phone and I'll be glad to help you if I can. In this session, we're going to look at the primary functions of the salespeople. We're going to look at the value of prospecting. We're going to discuss a little bit of who are qualified prospects. We're going to briefly review the four basic objections. We're going to look at how to ask questions. We're going to go through some closing, some sample closes to kind of get a feel for how you pull all this together. This is normally a three-hour workshop I do. We're going to try and condense this down into this session. So some stuff's going to be left out. Some stuff may be added that you won't need. If you need more stuff than what's in here, you can find it in other recordings. When we talk about defining what selling means, in its broadest sense, we're talking about the process that brings about the desired change in the behavior of the prospects. And I always encourage salespeople to use a needs-based selling technique. Over the years, the thing that I have found to be most useful in terms of my view of what I do is to help people buy rather than selling. And the reason I say that is when you think about selling, for most salespeople, they tend to see themselves as the issue. I'm selling. But who's the sales process actually about? It's about the prospect, right? So when I started looking at it as helping the prospect buy, that made me kind of operate more like a parachute. You know, a parachute only works when it's open. So I tended to have my mind open and started listening for those needs that the prospect wanted to solve. And oftentimes, the need they wanted to solve wasn't necessarily the one that was I was addressing or that was a part of my sales presentation. So when I say uh, the selling process, I'm talking about being able to uncover the needs that the prospect is willing to spend money on today to solve. In doing needs-based selling, and looking at it from the perspective of helping the prospect buy, we look at our primary functions. And it is not to be their friend. Prospects are not our friends. I'm not saying we're not friendly with customers, clients, people who pay us, that we make money on. The prospects are not our friend. If you need a friend, you should probably get a dog. Because your role as a salesperson is to disturb the prospect. If you don't disturb them, if you don't remove complacency, if you don't uncover the source of their dissatisfaction and help them relive the pain they're going through, if you don't instill a desire for changing the status quo, then what reason do they have to make a buying decision from you today? In order for them to make a buying decision, it's important to recognize that people buy on emotion or move to action by logic. So you have to sell to the emotion, sell to the pain, and then offer an intelligent and acceptable solution and that moves them to make an effective decision to buy from you when? When do you want them to buy from you? Today, right? So what exactly is selling? Well, prospecting is selling. When you're prospecting, what's the first thing you have to sell? Now, I hear salespeople talk all the time. I hear them on the calls, out in the field, and they're always selling their company first. And I would tell you the first thing that you have to sell is yourself. If you don't come across as the kind of person they're willing to talk to, the kind of person they're willing to disclose personal or company uh, financial or confidential information to, the chances of you actually selling them something are slim and none. And you'll never get to the point where they're interested in your company if they're not interested in talking to you. So you have to sell yourself first. After you sell yourself and they see value in you, at that point you can then add value to the appointment you want to have for them. You can give them a reason to want to sit down and talk with you. You can sell the interview. 
after they have agreed to sit down and meet with you, in other words, after they have bought the interview, then you sell your professionalism. It is in that professionalism where they bought you, they buy the interview, they buy the interview because they see you as a professional, you come across as someone that they would value, someone that they would trust, someone they'd be willing to spend their time with and share information with. At that point, they then have an interest in what company you're representing. So selling is prospecting. And prospecting means you sell yourself, you sell the interview, that sells your professionalism, and your professionalism means that they're now interested in what company you're with. And therein lies the challenge. When you're prospecting, you have to keep in mind that all your prospects are always tuned into WIIFM radio. What's in it for me? So your pitch, your approach, your sales presentation, your script has to talk from their point of view. You have to think from the prospect's point of view in order to uncover the information that triggers their dominant buying motive. When you understand their dominant buying motive, when you understand the way the prospect buys, then that helps you to succeed. So when I ask questions like, now did you design that or did the salesperson design that? Did you come up with the, that package or the salesperson suggested? Did you come up with that price or did the salesperson give you that price? That tells me how they buy. That tells me whether they depend on the salesperson to drive the product or the, the, the service or whether they drove what the product or service was that they wanted. However, simply understanding the prospect buying motive doesn't necessarily accomplish anything. You have to figure out the motive and then you have to have the finesse to use those motives to help that prospect. In other words, you have to have the skill to help that prospect make that buying decision from you today. So finding out the buying motive and then using these motives to help your prospect buy is the skill that's most important to you. And that's where you get the sales finesse from. Let's look at what happens when you prospect. Is there a value in prospecting? Well, when you work a prospect, when you invest your time, your energy, and your resources with a prospect, only one of three things are going to happen. You're either going to show an immediate profit. In other words, they bought from you and you made money. You're going to show a loss. You invested your time, energy, and resources getting in front of them. They didn't buy from you and, you, and you didn't make any money on that. You wasted all that time, energy, and resources. Or you created deferred return. That's what I call a referral. Maybe a callback, a second appointment. Sometimes the sales process is two or three steps. But that's called a deferred return. That has value in it. But prospecting is a value. There is a value to the prospecting and the time and energy that you put into prospecting. And it's important for you to know what that number is for yourself. You need to know what your matrix are and your ratios are so that you understand the value of prospecting and you know where to spend your time. Let's talk for a minute about the value of prospect. How do you know, what do you currently use as a yardstick to measure what a qualified prospect is? Who is a qualified prospect? Who is someone that you should spend your time, energy, and resources with? And just as important, who is someone that you should not spend your time, energy, and resources with? After years and years and years of being an old door-to-door -door guy, I came up with a very simple formula. And when my prospects do not meet each and every one of these criteria, to me that is not a qualified prospect and not someone I would make a full presentation. To me, a full presentation means going through the fact finder, making a product presentation, and giving a price to if they don't meet each one of these characteristics, I'm not spending that time doing a full presentation. So what are these characteristics? Well, first and foremost, they have to recognize that a problem exists. That doesn't mean that I see a problem exists. That means they have to recognize that a problem exists. If a problem exists and they don't recognize it, you're not going to make a dime, buddy. So I wouldn't even waste my time with them. So if they recognize that a problem exists, then they have to be motivated to solve this problem. I have spent countless hours and weeks and months and years with prospects that recognize they had a problem, but they weren't motivated to solve the problem. In other words, it wasn't uncomfortable enough. You know, it's like having a, a, a gravel versus a stone in your shoe. 
You might walk a little further with a gravel in your shoe, but you're not going to walk any further with a stone in your shoe. But let's just say that they recognize there's a problem exists. Let's say that they're motivated to solve that problem. Then they have to feel that my product or service will solve their problem. Just because they recognize a problem exists and they're motivated to solve that problem doesn't mean they think that your product or service is going to solve it. If they can't acknowledge through words or deeds that they have a sense that my product or service is going to solve their problem, I probably wouldn't make a full presentation and I definitely wouldn't give them a price. But if they recognize the problem exists, if they indicate to me and I have a sense that they're motivated to solve the problem, and they indicate to me and I have a feeling that they see my product as a potential solution or my service as a potential solution for them, then I want to know that they can qualify for my product. So whatever your qualification product is, whether it's credit, health, finances, whatever your qualification, they have to be able to qualify for the product. Because what difference does it make if they recognize the product exi problem exists? What difference does it make if they're motivated to solve the problem? And what difference does it make if they feel like that your product or service would solve their problem if they don't qualify to buy it? And qualifying to buy it might mean they actually have the authority to make the decision to buy it. Or they have the authority to spend the money to buy it. So that may mean that you're just not with the right person. But let's say they recognize a problem exists, they're motivated to solve the problem, they feel like your product or, product or service will solve the problem, they can qualify for the product. Then I want to make sure that they have the money to purchase the product or service. I'm not going to spend an hour or two hours with somebody get down to the lick log and they don't have the money to pay for it. There is none of this nonsense of coming back next week or next month or next quarter. If I'm going to have to come back next month, next week, next month or next quarter, then I can make the presentation then. If you don't have the money today, you don't need to hear the presentation today. So let's say they recognize the problem exists, they're motivated to solve the problem, they feel like your product will solve the problem, they can qualify for the product, they've got the money to purchase your product or service, Here's the big question. Are they willing to spend the money to purchase your product or service to solve their problem? If they've got the money but they're not willing to spend it, I mean everything else is in line but they're not willing to spend it, you've just wasted an hour of your time that you can't get back. And no matter how many appointments you got for the rest of the day or the rest of the week, it's not going to make up for the income you lost on this appointment because you made a presentation to someone you never should have made it to. Lastly, they have to be willing to purchase your product or service today. So they have to recognize the problem exists. They have to be motivated to solve this problem. They have to feel like your product or service will solve the problem. They have to be able to qualify for the product or service, whatever your qualification process is. They have to have the money to purchase your product or service. They have to be willing to spend the money to purchase your product or service. And they have to be willing to spend it when? Today. So whatever your sales cycle is, if it's a two or three call sales cycle, that's okay. As long as when you get down to the lick log, when you get down to the end of it, they're willing to purchase and spend that money to buy your product or service today. So recognize the value of a prospect and know what a qualified prospect is for you so that you spend your time making your presentations to qualified prospects. So as you're figuring out who your qualified prospect is, it takes you right back to your sales personality, doesn't it? And in order to be able to determine who a qualified prospect is and go through a fact finder with them, we have to have skills at human relationships. Keep in mind that prospects will do business with someone they like. So it's important to be yourself. If you try to be someone you're not, you'll be regarded as insincere. In my younger days, I used to do this all the time. I'd go out in the field with the big hitter, and I'd try to emulate exactly what he did, all, right down to the voice inflection. I'd try and be that person. And I never could figure out why I wasn't successful. Well, the reason I wasn't successful is I wasn't them. I didn't look for skills and techniques that I could integrate as part of my sales personality. I tried to have their sales personality. You need to have your own sales personality. It's also important to know your product. That's a sales strength. In order to match up the things that they're willing to spend their money on to, and, and to spend the money on solving a problem, 
you have to know how your product or, or service will solve the 